Probably. Um, they're very good at uh, encouraging heart attacks, surprise heart attacks in healthy people. If someone drops dead of a heart attack or in America dies in a plane accident, a politician who is anti the, uh, the agenda, those are the sort of questions you need to ask. Okay, well, obviously, these are your claims and certainly not made by this program, I have to say. Okay, uh, so, um, <sighs> Vicky says, I don't understand why there are always documents to show this stuff. If it is that par powerful, why bother leaving evidence? The evidence is absolutely overwhelming, and the BBC should be doing this program, should have done it 30 years ago when the first treaty came along. But everything that I'm saying is happening is in EU treaties. There have been six EU treaties well, passed by Parliament and signed by the Queen. Well, the first one was the uh, one that Ted Heath was involved Correct. in. Correct. And uh, we were told that we were going to enter a common market. Yeah, we were lied to. Um, if you read secret documents released from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which was the internal government um, illegally foisting the EU on us. Um, but under the 30-year rule, they've now released these documents, and uh, it's absolutely clear that Ted, Ted Heath knew he was abolishing Britain and expected the nation to be abolished before the end of this century. Well, if these documents have been revealed, why, don't, why doesn't the press write about it? Why don't they say, you know, that was the agenda from 30 years ago? Or uh, 40, is it 30 or 40 years ago? <laughs> Right, the, the press is controlled by a mixture of Freemasons and common purpose, and they never reveal the agenda. But, but these documents, you know, they're all, they've all got numbers like FCO 30 stroke 1048 and FCO 26 12 12. That's what, Foreign and Commonwealth Office or something? Correct, yeah. Um, these documents uh, reveal exactly what the government was doing, like they were trailing Enoch Powell and getting advanced copies of his speeches and ridicula ridiculing him in, in public, making him look ridiculous. And um, you know, they were tracking the anti-common market lead. They had civil servants writing into newspapers pretending they were members of the public, lauding the EU. So they spent a total of £461,000 on this campaign to deceive the public, a disinformation campaign. How much? 461000 according to FCO... 30, 12, 15. No, this 26, is 1976, 15. is it? This sort of... No, this is 1970. So in today's 70. money, you're probably talking about sort of 40 million. So we must assume that that, that campaign continued because uh, document FCO 26, 12, 15 is a summary of everything that they did and how to do it better in the future. So we must assume, and we don't, they haven't released any more documents, that that campaign is still going today. And they must be spending 100 million on it to deceive us. Well, I mean, these are very serious um, claims. Let's look at... Uh, uh, no, they're not claims. These are what government documents say. They're not my claims. These are stated by the government. But why would they release them, then, if they're so outrageous because they really thought that in 30 years time it would all be done and dusted well it's very very nearly is isn't it <laughs> well it is but the only good thing about the eu is the time scales always slip a few years so ted heath really thought in 1970 that in 30 years time britain would no longer this exist therefore the 30 year rule was okay but of course here we are 2010 the, the nation of britain was actually only abolished in legal terms, very dodgy legal terms, um, a year ago. You don't mean the 1st of January this year, you, don't, you mean... The nation of Britain was abolished on the 1st of January 2009... 2009, okay. ...by the Lisbon Treaty. Okay. So, and isn't something else going to happen still? Aren't we going to lose even more power in, at some other date this year, or...? Well, now it's just a case of the EU consolidating its power. How quickly can it do that? How quickly can it put our own police and Italian, German, French police on street corners um, with machine guns? Already, all our politicians since the year 2005 have been protected by machine guns. If you go into any MP's office in Westminster, you'll see machine guns. If you go to Portcullis House, 
which is the main office of MPs in Westminster. There are police with machine guns. You cannot run a dictatorship without protecting your glorious leaders with machine guns. Okay, so, so this abolition of the UK, um, what does it mean? What does it really mean? Does it mean that, I mean, right now, we're heading for a general election, aren't we, in May this year, probably May the 6th? It's not really a general election because all the political parties are controlled by the European Union. The Conservatives have been EU-controlled since the 1960s, the Labour and Lib Dems since 1985, and the BNP and the UKIP leaderships are controlled by the EU as well. Well, you stood as a UKIP MP, didn't you? Yes, and I stood for the leadership of, the, of UKIP as well. But I really am anti-EU, so they couldn't let me get anywhere. It is, it is, you know, people will say, listening to this, and with due respect, David, they'll say, well, that's sour grapes, isn't it? You didn't get the job, so now you're dissing them. No, um, this is just a fact. I mean, over the last 30 years, they have moved thousands of people up into positions of power on the basis of the fact that they're pro-EU. So if you want to be an MEP, you, you couldn't get in. Uh, without going through the shortlist system, uh, the party list system. And you couldn't get through the party list system unless you were pro-EU. And that is how they got a majority of 138 MPs on the 21st of January 2008 for the Lisbon Treaty and to abolish this nation. And um, they only debated it for two weeks. And the Queen signed it into law on the 19th of June 2008 and the Lisbon Treaty abolishing our nation came into effect on the 1st of January 2009. Now you're asking, where do we go from here? Well, shall I just... Do you mind if I go back into the past a bit? Not at all. Um, the, the European Union was not founded by Monet or Salter or Schumann or all the people they try to invent and pretend as being these wonderful benefactors. It was started off by Hermann Goering, who made a speech in 1940 establishing something he called the European Economic Community. And in 1942, there was the first conference of the EEC at Berlin University. This uh, is during the war, then, obviously. Yes, this was the Nazis. Yeah, no, I appreciate that <laughs> Hermann Goering was a Nazi, yes. What I'm saying is he had this, he had this conference in, in Berlin yeah. during the Second World War. So obviously yes. none of the Allies attended. No. Well, I imagine they didn't. No. no, but it was at that conference that the, the EEC was set in stone. That's where they came up with all the documents were produced then. The common monetary policy, the common economic policy, the common fisheries policy, the common agricultural policy. The whole thing was set in stone at that conference in Berlin in 1942, and it hasn't changed since, except one thing. What was the one thing? I haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In 1943, von Ribbentrop um, held the first summit of the European Union. He was a German chancellor, wasn't he? Or yes, deeply involved with uh, Nancy Astor and the royal family, our royal family. At the uh, Gotha Sachs Coburgs. Correct. Otherwise known as Windsor. Correct. The Germans. So, um, uh, <clears throat> 13 nations, not us, attended the first summit of the EEC in Germany mm -hmm. under von Ribbentrop. And um, in uh, 1944, at the Rotes House Hotel in Schrasburg, um, the more enlightened members of the Nazi High Command had a meeting with big German companies included, like IG Farben, um, where they commissioned the European Union to carry forward German ambitions um, because they could see defeat looming. And Hitler himself commissioned the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst Intelligence Department to control future development of the European Union. And um, in 1946, that one change you wanted to know about, you couldn't sell Nazism to anyone in 1946, so they switched the European Union from a Nazi to a communist basis, and it's been communist ever since. And um, in 1958, Ted Heath, Geoffrey Rippon, 